wish to express my very sincere gratitude to all of you for being here in Sri Mayapur Dham to celebrate this, the auspicious festival of Sri Govardhan Puja. And my unlimited gratitude to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, by whose compassion we have all been attracted to be here together today. When Lord Chaitanya was in Vrindavan, he went to the Govardhan Hill. His first sight of a stone from Govardhan Hill awakened within him such divine love that he embraced that rock. In the ecstasies of Sri Radharani's love, he wept incessantly because he understood that stone to be Krishna's own personal transcendental body. Then he performed the parikrama of Sri Govardhan Hill. With his bare feet, he walked the 21 kilometers, visiting all the holy places. Especially at Sri Govinda Kund, he remembered his Param Guru, Sri Padmadhavendra Puri. And how he also did the Govardhan Parikrama. After which, Gopal, the deity, manifested before him. And Madhavendra Puri, on the Lord's instruction, made an altar on Gopardhan Hill and performed the Anakuta ceremony. He invited the local Brijabhasis to be mountains and mountains and mountains of prasad, and lakes of liquid prasad, or bhoga, I'm sorry, bhoga, to offer it to Sri Gopal. It was such a popular festival that every village in Vrindavan would come to Madhavendra Puri and ask, we also want to make this festival for Gopal. Each village would bring practically their entire stock of milk, milk products, grains, everything. And had their best of best Brahmins do the cooking, had sumptuous feast for everyone after offering to Gopal, and they would all then do circumambulation of Govardhan Hill. This continued week after week after week. It was by Gopal's will, the reenactment of the original Govardhan Puja that took place approximately 5,000 years ago at the time of the des descent of Lord Krishna. The Srimad Bhagavatam describes it in great detail. Kavi Karnapur and his Ananda Vrindavan Shampu describes more details. And our Gaudiya Vaishnavacharyas have expanded and expounded upon the glories of Govardhan Hill. 
With your permission, I would like to make some attempt to share this story with you today. Navadweep is none different than Brindavan. Factually, we are all in Brajapumi today. And this particular holy day of Govardhan Puja is of such ultimate sanctity. And especially for those who hear with sincere attention and faith this narration, it quickly awakens one's love for Krishna. Such a good fortune we have today to be together. At this time of the year, Krishna saw Nanda Maharaj and the other cowherd men making elaborate arrangements for a particular type of yajna. Krishna asked Nanda Maharaj, can you tell me the name of this sacrifice? Who is the guru who has told you to perform this sacrifice? Why are you performing this sacrifice? Why are people running around in an apparently very mechanical way to make arrangements for this? Dear Father, you may think I'm just a young child and I may not understand this, but I am your son, your family member. One should not keep secrets from one's well-wishers. So please tell me everything. Nanda Maharaj explained how every year, for countless generations, himself as well as his forefathers would perform this puja to Indra. And he explained why. Because we are Baishyas and we are making our living by taking care of cows and growing, growing grains. And this is only possible when there are abundant rains. Indra is the demigod who supervises over the rainfall. And he is a person. So if we satisfy him, he will give us proper rains. If not, we will not survive. So therefore, we are happily engaged in preparing for the Indra Puja. Krishna, who was then only a child of seven years old, whatever comes in a person's life, individually and collectively, is due to one's karma. If you perform good works, you'll get good results. If you perform bad works, you'll get bad results. And the demigods, they have no independence. All they could do is reciprocate with your karma. Because we're pious, we're taking care of cows, Indra has to send rain. Why do we have to do this puja for him? Besides that, look, the ocean. The ocean doesn't do any Indra pujas. The ocean doesn't even need water, but still torrents of rain are falling in the ocean. So whatever is meant according to our karmic destiny will happen, and the demigods are simply agents to deliver our own karmic destiny. Now, as far as I understand, each of the four varnas have their particular duty. The Brahmins are studying the scriptures and they are teaching the Vedic scriptures. The Kshatriyas, they are heroically protecting humanity and protecting the earth. The Vaishyas, they are growing food, protecting cows, doing trading, doing mercantile banking and so forth. And the Shujas are performing menial services, labor for the other classes. 
If one just follows one's varma according to the prescribed duties, then one will get good karma and the demigods must bless them. We are Vaishyas. And specifically our occupation is protecting the cows. What do we need Indra? It is Govardhan Hill that is supplying such fresh, green, luscious grasses to the cows. And it is the Brahmins whose blessings upon us make everything auspicious. So today we should worship the Brahmins, the cows, and Govardhan Hill. And I will tell you, dear father, how we should do that. First, we should invite all the important people from all directions, especially the Brahmins who will bless us. Then, we should cook so much boga, mountains and mountains and mountains of boga of all varieties, rice and cakes and rotis, and we should make kuns, lakes of sweet rice and condensed milk and nectar drinks. We should make plenty of rasgulas and ladus and halava and, and pakoras and samosas and many, many, many varieties of sabjis and all the grains should be glistening with the sweet golden color of ghee. And then we should offer it all to Govardhan Hill. After all, Govardhan Hill is who is sustaining us. And after this, we should have divine music, people playing flutes and, and horns and conch shells and stringed instruments. And then uh, we should feed everyone sumptuously. We should feed the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, the Sudras, the untouchables. We should, we should feed the dogs, the animals. Everyone, without discrimination, should have sumptuous prasad to their full satisfaction. And after everyone is filled up with Govardhan's Maha Prasad, then with musical instruments, we should circumambulate Govardhan Hill, keeping the cows in the front. Father, let us do this immediately. Nanda Maharaj said, we can do Indra Puja and then we can do this Govardhan Puja after. <laughs> Krishna said, why, why waste this time? Whatever is there for Indra, offer it to Govardhan Hill today. Now, Nanda Maharaj and all the Brijabhasis, their life, their soul, their everything was only to make Krishna happy. All the rules and the regulations of all the scriptures. The only goal is to please Krishna. Atapum birdvijas tristas varana shrama vibhagasha shvanushtatasya dharmasya samsadir haritoshana. What is the success of following any rules and regulations of the scriptures? Of following our varna or our ashram? It is to please Krishna. If Krishna is pleased, everything is auspicious. If Krishna is displeased, if we, even if we do everything meticulously correct according to the rituals or the traditions, we have miserably failed spiritually. And Krishna sees not the thing that we offer, Krishna accepts the purpose in which it is offered. Krishna reciprocates with our love. Patram pushpam palam toyam yomi bhakta prayachtati. Even if we offer Krishna a little leaf of flower, fruit, or water, if it is offered with devotion, Krishna accepts it. Krishna wanted to establish this principle. And the Brijabhasis had such spontaneous love for Krishna. 
please understand, this is not a small thing. Some of us may think Indra may exist, Indra may not exist, but they knew that Indra does exist. They knew with full realization that he's the king of heaven and that if he's angry and he withdraws rain, we will all die. Krishna was asking them to take a big risk in this purport that we're reading today. So, <clears throat> what is described in this purport is they, Krishna was asking them to defy the authority of the government, the universal government, to break the laws and accept the consequences. But for the Brijabhasis, all of that was irrelevant. Only one thing mattered. Will it make Krishna happy? That is Vrindavan. The Braja Gopis, when Krishna played on his flute, just a year later, they left their homes, they, they, they abandoned all the social traditions, they risked being ostracized by the whole society, They, they risked being exiled from their homes forever. But they did not consider these things. They only considered Krishna's calling us. They did not go there for their own happiness. Because they only had one happiness. To make Krishna happy. That is a Brijabhasi. Unmotivated, uninterrupted love on a spontaneous platform. Nanda Maharaj agreed. If this is what will make you happy, Krishna, we will do. And Krishna orchestrated things very, very nice. He gave a warning too. He said, if anyone performs this Govardhan Puja but does not follow my instructions, they may be bit by the snakes on Govardhan Hill. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So the Brijabhasis, they made mountains and mountains and mountains of bhoga. High mountains, glistening with ghee. And kuns of, 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 of liquid bhoga and so many things. It was glorious to see. Absolutely glorious. And then they made the offering to Govardhan Hill. That brings us to today's verse. Krishna, who was standing with the Brijabhasis, he manifested himself on Govardhan Hill huge form that was shining like millions of suns. So beautiful. And Krishna and the Brijabhasis all bowed down to that form. Krishna was bowing down to himself. In one form he was a little cowherd boy, and the other form he was the massive form of Shigiriraj. Krishna said, look, look, Giriraj has taken a personal form just to reciprocate with all the love that you have offered him. And see how his form is glowing with so much pleasure. And see his lotus-like eyes. And see his mouth is like a massive cave. And usually go over downhill, we think, the, the trees are his arms, but today, look, he has two gigantic long arms decorated with, with jeweled bracelets. And today, Giriraj 
just to reciprocate with our love is going to accept all of our offerings. That massive personal form of Sri Govardhan, then with his arms, put all the mountains and lakes of Boga in his mouth. There was nothing left. And with a deep voice, he called out, Anior. Give me more. But there was nothing left. <laughs> On Krishna's instruction, they had already prepared everything that they had in the entire village of Braj and offered it to Govardhan. And he ate it all within a second and cried out, Anior! Give me more. And with folded hands, they turned to Krishna, now what should we do? <laughs> and Krishna indicated, offer him some tulsi leaves with love. They offered him a tulsi leaf. And Govardhan was satisfied. Whether we offer Krishna mountains and mountains and mountains or one tulsi leaf, if it is offered with love and devotion, Krishna is satisfied. In this way, Srila Prabhupada explains, Krishna showed the world that he is non-different than Govardhan Hill. Govardhan Hill is the divine Satchitananda Vigraha, the form of Krishna. And every particle of Govardhan Hill is full-fledged a deity of Krishna. And therefore, so many of our great acharyas have worshipped Govardhan Hill. After this magnificent Anakuta ceremony, Krishna arranged for everyone to be fed. So much prasad of actually Govardhan. After he tasted the Tulsi, he manifested all the mountains and lakes of prasad once again in front of everyone and they distributed. People ate and they ate and they ate. So much they ate. Full satisfaction. Totally jubilant. Why? Because they understand that Govardhan is Krishna and they satisfied Krishna. That is their only happiness. And the Brijabhasis, they only eat for Krishna because it was pleasing Krishna for pleasing Krishna that they eat all these mountains and mountains of prasad. They were eating and eating only for Krishna's satisfaction. And therefore their soul were, their souls were just jubilant with transcendental love. Srila Prabhupada says, when you water the root of the tree, every part of the tree is satisfied. As we become purified in our consciousness, our happiness is, is to the degree we make Krishna happy. To the degree our consciousness is covered by the cloud of ahankar or false ego and envy, we're under the illusion that we can be happy by our own separate endeavors. We can be feeding our body with all kinds of gratificatory experiences, but the soul is starving. As we purify our heart by chanting Hare Krishna, our only desire is to please Krishna. Srila Prabhupada writes this in Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita, that the test that one is chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and the names of God sincerely is that one has a sincere enthusiasm to serve. If we have selfish desires, that means we're not really chanting sincerely. Our service attitude and our enthusiasm to serve is the test of our chanting of Hare Krishna. And how is that? Because as our 
Chaito Dharpana Marajanam, as our heart is becoming cleansed, our only fulfillment, our only happiness, our only purpose is to please Krishna. And how do we please Krishna? Gopi Bharatura Padakamala Yoda Dasa 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 Das by being the servant of the servant of the servant. So everyone was eating and eating and eating for Krishna's satisfaction. Then under Krishna's instructions, bands were playing sweet music, and the gopas were in the front with the cows, and Nanda Maharaj, Krishna, and all his little friends, and they were dancing and singing around Govardhan Hill. Behind them were more singers and musicians, and the, behind them were the gopis riding on ox carts, they finished, they completed the entire parikrama, jubilantly. That is the original Govardhan parikrama, led by Krishna and Balaram themselves. On this day, here in Vrindavan Dham. Everyone was happy, except one person. Would any of you like to guess who that person was? <laughs> yes, we are. Today we are doing kirtan of the names of Indra. <laughs> Indra was furious. This was a major insult. Now please understand. Indra, he has his prestige. He has his wife, Sachi. He has all these demigods and all of these celestial people all around him who are worshiping him and honor him and chanting Vedic hymns to him. Hymns to him. <laughs> this was an insult. Right in front of everybody. The Vrijabhasis who offer this puja to him to every, every year, it's a regulation. They're offering it to a mountain instead. It would be one thing to offer it Shiva or Brahma, but a mountain? And also the nature of material attachment is we become habituated to things that we get on a regular basis. Yes? When we get some sort of pleasure regularly, we usually become very habituated and dependent on that pleasure. But that goes for spiritual life too. If we regularly chant Hare Krishna Mantra 16 rounds, we become attached to the holy names. If we regularly go to the Mangalarti to see the beautiful form of Shri Shri Radha Madhava Panchatattva Narasimha Dev or whatever deities you may worship in the temples or homes you are from, if you do it sincerely with a desire to serve, because it's done regularly, you become attached to the form of the Lord, to the name of the Lord. Nasta Prayeshya Padre Su Nityam Bhagavati Sevaya. The Bhagavatam just instructs us that we should read and speak Srimad Bhagavatam daily, regularly. If we do so, we become naturally attached to the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. And when we fill our days with these regulative principles, it gives us paramdrasvani vartate. It gives us a higher taste. And not only that, but it doesn't leave us much time for these other things. So the way we break our bad habits are by replacing it with good habits. Through regulation. Very important. Now, Indra, he was regulated <laughs> to get this... Indra Puja from Nanda Maharaj. Not only Nanda Maharaj's life, but all of his forefathers for so many, many generations. All of a sudden, what he was expecting, he didn't get. 
This is another psychological principle of human nature in the conditioned state. The more we expect something, the more we are frustrated when we don't get it. Do any of you have this experience? <laughs> if you want to be peaceful in this world, just don't expect anything. Then you're transcendental. If you expect respect, if you don't get it, it burns the heart. If nobody gives you respect, and then the next day nobody else gives you respect, it doesn't matter. It's like, uh, so what? But if you're getting it, then you don't get it. Uh, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> and another thing, if you expect something, you cannot be grateful when you get it, because you expect it. Gratitude is a basic principle which is connected to humility. A humble heart is grateful for everything. Even pain, failure, Dishonor. A true devotee is grateful to Krishna for sending those things. I deserve worse, Krishna, but you're just giving me a little bit just to help me to turn to you more sincerely and to neutralize my past karmas. Whatever good we get, we think I don't deserve it. So we're really happy because we're grateful. Whatever difficulties come into our life, we're grateful because we're expecting worse. A grateful heart is like a fertile field where the seed of bhakti can grow without restriction. An ungrateful heart is like a hard, dry field. You could put water on it but it will take very, very long time for that seed to grow properly. But to be grateful, we should not expect favors from others. A devotee is more interested in how I can serve, not what I can get, but what I can give. If you're condition of happiness is what you can give. Your happiness is under your control because you have the power to give. But you don't have the power what you're going to receive. So Indra, he was expecting this type of honor and all this food for himself. All this worship. When he didn't get it, he was furious. He lost his mind. Now, Krishna is so merciful. Krishna staged this plat pastime for many reasons. One of the reasons is because Indra is a devotee. He's not a demon. In fact, all the demons, the first thing they usually do is attack Indra. Yes? If he was one of them, they wouldn't attack him. He's the leader of the demigods. He's not a demon. And we read in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Srimad Bhagavatam, when Indra performs a yagya in Indra Loka, Lord Vishnu personally comes on Garuda. Not invisibly. Visibly! and accepts the offerings. Indra is a very, very important devotee. But he's Karma Mishra Bhakta. He's a devotee that still wants to enjoy material life. He wants to serve Krishna and enjoy simultaneously. And the facilities that Krishna is giving him for service, he wants some of that for himself too. And the tendency is when we go on that path, we become so infatuated by false pride that we even forget
get who's giving it to us and who it's for. False pride is such an enemy. When Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Kuramakshetra during his South Indian tour, the leper, Basudev, was so eager to see the Lord. His body was infested with the disease of leprosy. His skin was deteriorating. It smelled horrible with oozing, pussing blood of disease. His fingers, his nose and toes had just melted away. There were unlimited worms eating away his flesh. But he was thinking, this body is as much the worms as mine. I'm living here, the worms are living here. If a worm would fall out, Vasudeva would offer his respectful obeisances to that worm and very carefully pick him up and put him back where he fell from. You cannot imitate him. But we can understand what was the caliber of his devotion. He came to see Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya already left. But Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is the super soul in everyone's heart, came all the way back. He, re he reversed his pilgrimage just to fulfill the desire of his devotee. An outcast leper. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, upon seeing Vasudev, came to embrace him. Vasudev said, no, my Lord, no. The Lord embraced him. My body is abominable. Nobody will ever touch me. Nobody can even come near me because of the stench of the diseased smells and what to speak of the diseased excretions that are coming from my body. You are the supreme personality of Godhead and you have embraced me. Upon the embrace, Vasudev's leprosy was cured and his body became beautiful with a golden complexion, perfect health. And Vasudev in his mind became worried. You see, when he had leprosy, he was more or less safe because there was nothing to be proud of. But now, he's Vasudev Amrita Prada. Lord Chaitanya was named that. Lord Chaitanya is now named after me. <laughs> the supreme personality of God, it is now named after me, Vasudev Amrita Prada, one who gave nectar to Vasudev. People are gonna look at me and see, you have received so much mercy from the Lord. What happens if I start thinking of myself better than someone else? What happens if I start becoming proud? Then all my devotion is spoiled. Humility nourishes bhakti. Pride covers it. He was afraid of pride. But Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him, just continuously chant this Hare Krishna mantra. And whoever you meet, just teach them about Krishna. And if you do this sincerely, pride will never infect your heart. Indra was outraged. Why? Because he had pride and it was trampled on. He started talking to his associates. See what they have done in Vrindavan. <coughs> they have... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they have violated the Vedic injunctions. And the words of this talkative little boy, Krishna, they must be taught a great lesson. I will destroy them. He called for the Samvarataka clouds. 
you have never seen clouds like this in this life. These are the clouds of ultimate devastation that come at the time of a pralaya. These clouds shower down such torrents of rain that they completely cover the lower planets and the middle planets all the way up to Swarga Loka practically. Everything is inundated. Indra called for Sambartaka clouds. First he praised them. He wanted to inspire them to really work hard for him. He said, oh, my clouds, I am so affectionate to you. I'm so proud of you, what you have done, what you can do. Now I have a mission for you. They have defied me in Vrindavan because of that talkative little Krishna. Go there now with all of your strength and destroy Vrindavan and all of its residents. Some Vartaka clouds were thinking, this is easy. Usually we have to destroy the whole universe. Now all we have to do is destroy one village. <laughs> they came over Vrindavan. Thing, such thick, black clouds. All the way from Rasatala to Swargaloka. The entire universe within those areas was pitch dark. Not even a single ray of the sun could get through those clouds. They were like massive, massive mountains of black cloud. There was fear everywhere. Then came the rumbling of thunder. The type of thunder that makes even nuclear bombs sound very, very low volume. Massive thunder. Rajabhasis are looking up. Torrents of rain start pouring down. And so much lightning, constant lightning. The lightning looked so vicious, like the forked tongues of serpents. And when the lightning hit the water, it created like electrical explosions. When the rain poured down, it did not fall on drops. It fell in columns at high speed. It is described that, the, that each column of rain was like a huge ancient trunk of a banyan tree. Yesterday at Srikanda you saw these nice banyan tree trunks. But this is Kali Yuga. Can you imagine the trunks of the banyan trees in Dwapa Yuga it was pouring down viciously. Not only torrents and torrents of water like an ocean just, just pouring out of these clouds, but also large balls of ice called hail was just pounding down and pounding down. And the poor um, cows they wanted to protect their calves from the rains. And with the, uh, their neck, they have that nice, soft, um, what is it called? You know what it is. Nice, soft coming down from their neck. They were covering their calves with it to try to protect them. And the poor cows were being battered by the hail and crushed by the rains. And their eyes were weeping, crying, in pain. And the balls. The rain was hitting their horns, then bouncing off and hitting the hump on their back. 
then splitting up into small like pearls. The cows and the bulls were soaked wet. The bulls were looking up at the sky and the clouds, angry as anything. <laughs> Roaring. And the poor Brijabasis, they saw that nobody could tell what was a high part of the ground, what was a low part of the ground. Within minutes, everything was about to be devastated. They all came to Krishna. Krishna, you are the protector of Gokul. When things were nice, they were thinking Krishna's completely depending on us. The cows are thinking if I don't, if I don't provide Krishna milk, Krishna will die. What to speak of Yashoda and all other gopis? If we don't make our butter very nicely for Krishna to come to steal, then he'll be hungry. But when dangerous situation came, they didn't see Krishna as God. They still saw him as their little boy. But they understood he has some special power to protect us. He protected from Putana, from Trinavarta, whatever. Whenever we turn to Krishna, something wonderful happens. So they all turn to Krishna. Krishna, all this rain is because Indra's mad, and Indra's mad because of you. <laughs> the Gopas, they didn't say just us. They understood Gobramanya Devai. Krishna's very affectionate to the cows. Look at your cows, look at the calves, look at the bulls. They are suffering, they're drenched, they're trembling, they're crying. Protect us, please. Krishna smiled. Krishna said, I think that this is the work of Indra. He's just too proud, that's all. But the trouble you are facing is as insignificant as the hunger of a person who has just taken a sumptuous feast. <laughs> then Krishna, he said, Please come with me. And he went toward Govardhan Hill. On that day, he didn't even bother tightening his belt. <laughs> when Krishna saw some serious thing that he was to do, some challenge, he would tighten his belt. Like when Kaliya, he tightened his belt and he jumped in the water. When he would wrestle with the gopas, he would tighten his belt and he would lose. But Krishna really wanted to smash the pride of his Indra. He didn't even bother tightening his belt. He just went right to Govardhan Mountain and lifted Giriraj effortlessly as a little child picks up a mushroom. He didn't eat it, he picked it up. <laughs> Krishna doesn't eat mushrooms. He lifted it, it's like a little child. With the little finger of his left hand, he balanced the entire Giriraj. And as he was lifting it, can you imagine, he was uprooting the mountain from the ground. There was massive, loud volumes of sound echoing throughout the entire universe. And as he was lifting it, the flowers of Govardhan Hill showered from the trees to celebrate the glorious festival of Sri Giridhari. Like pearls falling to honor and, and, and of gratitude toward Krishna. Then Krishna said, for your benefit, I have lifted the Govardhan Hill. Now, please understand that I am doing this to destroy the mountain of pride that it was in, within the heart of Indra. Meanwhile, when he lifted Govardhan Hill, in those days Govardhan Hill was so large, it had pointed peaks. And the peaks of Govardhan 
were actually stabbing and splitting the Samvardhaka clouds. And the lions on Govardhan Hill, they were so totally fearless because they were empowered by the touch of Krishna's finger that they were roaring at the clouds. They thought that they were big elephants. <laughs> and with their claws, they were just attacking the clouds. And the Samvartaka clouds had never experienced anything like this before. <laughs> they were running away in all directions. They had to go higher up. <laughs> torrents and torrents and torrents of rain. Krishna said, don't be in anxiety. Please don't be in anxiety. Because Giriraj was so pleased by your offerings, 